Check. Good morning. Um, usually the first thing people ask me when I start talking about this work was, is this something you always wanted to do? And the answer is like working in prisons? The answer is no, because I just didn't really think about it. I'm from rural Alabama. It wasn't on my bandwidth as a super young person. It became more on my bandwidth when I was in middle school and high school. Um, this work chose me. Um, I actually didn't apply for this grant to, to teach. Um, the National Endowment for the Arts reached out to me about um, did I want to teach poetry? Um, and I said yes. And they didn't finish the, right, it was like, do you want to teach poetry? And I had been out of graduate school um, and moved back here. I'd been out for about a year and a half, maybe two years. And um, I was like, absolutely, I want to teach poetry. Um, and they said, well, it's at the Talladega Federal Prison. And I was like, that's fine. Um, I think it's important to say before moving forward with the whole history of this, this program and, and my work with this is that I am an educational advocate to my core and an educational advocate for people who don't have automatic pathways to higher education and people who are in rural communities around the state um, who are often also economically impoverished areas of the state that do not have enough meaningful and sustained educational experiences for young people. Um, so to say that I have a bee in my bonnet about some things here in Alabama might be a small understatement and I will try to keep myself in check. <clears throat> so teaching poetry inside of a prison was not um, intimidating to me because I see human beings um, and this can cause complications when you have individuals who want to exist inside systems of hierarchy and acknowledgement and things like that, but that's not how I see the world. I see human beings and we're in different places doing different things with different life circumstances. So when I walked into the Talladega Federal Prison to teach my first class, um, what I saw were people who stepped into writing poetry for very similar reasons that I studied poetry in graduate school and wrote poetry as a young person, in that I had something I wanted to say. Never really has there been an aspiration for the next great American poet. That's not on my list of things that I feel drawn to do with my life. But you can be engaged with um, arts in, in myriad directions because it fuels us and sustains us as human beings and it is one of the most powerful ways to bridge divide. Um, but in order for the arts to bridge divide, people actually have to have access to them. And we know that there is not equal access in Alabama or many places um, around the country. So I found people who wanted to write poetry. They were trying to sort things out. They wanted to communicate something. Many individuals wanted to, um, they wanted to write and share with their families because it was a meaningful way for them to be engaged with them. Um, and I fell in love with it. I did not fall in love with prison. Prisons are horrible. I fell in love with people inside of a place that is meant to destroy them, who had the bandwidth and the stamina and the vulnerability to say, I am going to learn anyway. I am going to create anyway. And I want this for myself. And I also want this for my children and my community. Right? And we know if you are in higher ed administration, you know. Um, if you have someone in a family who has gone to a four year institution, it is infinitely more likely that future generations will follow. 
right? That you're creating that pathway. So the more you create opportunities for engagement in arts and education, the more you are um, influencing generations. And I would argue generational poverty, um, which is significant in all of this. Um, so I started teaching at the Talladega Federal Prison in 2001. In 2002, um, I started teaching at the Julia Tutwiler Prison for Women. Um, again, poetry. Taught there for several years, then expanded, start expanding to um, men's facilities, men's state facilities. And across the board, every single class, every single experience, I saw human beings starving for information literally starving for information. And you know how sometimes you learn things the hard way by sticking your foot so far down your mouth that you don't feel like you'll ever be able to retrieve it? So teaching in a poetry class at Tutwiler, and we're talking about poetry and how books of poetry are put together with intention. It isn't just the randomized you know, order of, of um, poems in the book. So I just said, why don't you go to the library and get a book of poetry and read it from first poem to last poem? And they just looked at me and they said, Miss Kyes, there's no books of poetry here. Anthologies, but not a single collection by an individual poet. So at that point, that's when our Books Behind Bars drive started. Um, to date, we've put about 26,000 books inside of the Alabama Department of Corrections. If you want to learn and there is no access to information, how exactly do you learn? This is a question that is for the place of incarceration. It is also a question that is um, for rural Alabama where we don't have reliable internet, right? People are like, oh, just look it up on the internet. Well, that's charming um, if you live in a place that has a cell tower or you have DSL. So our program strategically grew um, based on two primary factors. One, I have always responded to what people inside wanted for classes. There is a pretty horrible track record in higher education where very well-meaning people inside of institutions step into communities and say, I know what's best for you because I am from the academic institution. There's been a lot of harm done by universities into communities that way. I'm not interested in that. What do you want to learn? What do you want? for your educational goals, your creative goals, what is gonna help you build your educational community inside. So that's subject matter wise, that's how we grew. Funding is also how we grew. Um, for literally the first 13, 14 years of our program, we could only find significant funding in the arts and humanities. We could not find programming to support STEM, which blows me away. Um, and you know, those of you in the room that write grants, you know you, there's not a lot of wiggle room to just change your mind in the middle of something and say, now I wanna shift and do this. Um, so we felt very, very restricted. Um, though I spent a lot of time writing grants. Um, a lot of time writing grants. Um, so fast forward a little bit to 2015. Um, from basically 2002 until 2015, um, I and everyone at the Alabama Department of Corrections were operating under the assumption that the statute that exists in the state of Alabama that says a person who is incarcerated cannot earn an academic credential. Okay, I'm gonna back up and say this one more time. There is a statute in the state of Alabama that says someone who is incarcerated cannot earn an academic credential. Meanwhile, 
one of the most successful things to help people inside prepare for the rest of their life when they leave is education. Why are we all sitting in an institution of education right now? We know, right? This is, this is, this is a thing that sets you up. In 2015, the commissioner, Kim Thomas, called me one day, and I assure you, when you're driving down the road and the commissioner of the Alabama Department of Corrections calls you, you start sweating, like, a lot, <laughs> a lot. I'm like, oh my gosh, what have we done? And he says, I found the loophole. And I'm like, what are you talking about? And he said, the statute is for two-year colleges because when the statute was written, no one ever imagined that an Auburn University would want to do any kind of educational programming inside of a prison in the state of Alabama. I kid you not, three weeks later, the call came out for Second Chance Pell. Second Chance Pell um, is an experimental sites program that um, emerged during the Obama administration that uh, it's the experimental sites runs through the U.S. Department of Education. And Pell funds were taken away from people who were incarcerated in 1994, effectively killing most higher ed programs in the country. So we always knew education would work. Second chance Pell was the experiment, right? The language of experiment and putting science on this. Um, to start the ball rolling for can we undo this policy. You and academia understand this. There are windows of time inside of ac academic institutions where people in leadership positions are all in the same boat. <laughs> it doesn't necessarily happen a lot. But there was this really beautiful window where the provost and the president at Auburn were like, yes, we should do this. But it is also because we had such an amazingly long track record of, of doing programming inside. So we applied for Second Chance Pell. We were selected and built the first ever Bachelor of Science um, program in interdisciplinary studies um, from a public institution inside of the DOC. December of last year, we had 11 men graduate. Um, and their collective GPA blew the collective GPA on Auburn's campus out of the water. So I will brag on them for a minute. We have also developed a program in Birmingham called the Community Education Resource Center. And, and this exists because um, many of you might be familiar with the term reentry. Um, it's, it's kind of a, a challenging term for me, but um, we have people leaving incarceration who have been incarcerated for 35 or 40 years. Um, the world has so profoundly changed. As a land-grant institution, as an educational institution, our job is to educate and provide services to the people of Alabama. So we built this space in Birmingham to help with educational and informational transition. We can't really support housing. We don't have the bandwidth to do that. We have partner organizations that we work with. But, you know, nuts and bolts of finances and um, understanding scams and using computers and the forever long process of getting an ID so that you can get a job. Um, so we have all of these, these barriers, and there are a lot of people that think it isn't the job of an educational institution to be involved. Yes, it is. Educational institutions have been working to support people to remove barriers since their inception. We're just deciding to include people now who have not normally been considered. A hundred percent, the way I step into this work and how our program is structured is a, is a little bit of an anomaly nationally. We are not interested in recidivism statistics. Uh, it, it's, um, and the language that someone inside should um, get an education 
um, because it's going to make us safer it should actually be deeply offensive to all of us. We invest in education for human beings because human beings want to learn, period. We spend so much time qualifying why someone deserves something rather than let's build educational opportunities. Let's help communities build structures and opportunities that they want be the land grant institution. And I understand this is complicated because there isn't an excess of funding. It is also doable. Y'all have heard the phrase squeezing blood from a turnip? Yeah, that, that's our early years, like that was our reality. Didn't matter, we were going to figure it out because it's important. Um, I would be very surprised if there is a single person in this room who does not have a connection to someone who has lived experience with incarceration. It's a family member, it's a friend of a friend, it's a coworker's son or daughter, it's like whatever. It affects us all, right? Just like public education affects us all, just like public health affects us all, just like impacts on the environment affect us all. So my goal is to reduce some of the chronic qualifications that we use to say why this human being deserves. People are complicated. We know that. My favorite term is every single human being is a beautiful disaster. Everybody, all of us, right? If you walk into spaces where people are being held for accountability and punishment and whatever the language is that you want to pull into this, um, they are still human beings. They are tethered to families, they are tethered to communities, um, they are tethered to us, right? So it isn't a remove, it is us. So investing in people, any people, is investing in what Alabama can be. And I am blindly naive and pessimistic about what Alabama can be. Um, People show up for our classes for differing reasons. Um, and there, there are gut-wrenching things that happen inside. Uh, the first poetry class I ever taught at the men's um, medium security facility here in Alabama, there was a, a man who finished the poetry class. We handed them a certificate. Um, and he was a mountain of a man. He looked like he belonged in my family, like big, big man. He just starts bawling, like uncontrollably deep heave sobbing. That act of vulnerability inside of a prison is extraordinary, especially inside of a men's prison. Um, and how the young men in the class responded to him, I got you, man, you're good, we're proud of you. Um, and he said, I have never finished anything in my life. I would argue that we haven't created structures to allow people to finish things. We build structures based on easy access um, and, and people who live, you know, the white middle class constructed life. There's no other way to say that, right? Um, so our educational processes by themselves often um, make it easy for people to disengage because we're our system is not responding to the needs of communities and timelines um, so this guy went on to tell me later on when we were talking after class that he got kicked out when he was nine years old he was effectively homeless as a nine-year-old living in abandoned vehicles and stealing food from the 7-Eleven. 
And yes, he is incarcerated because he broke the law. Really? Like, how could he not break the law? <laughs> really? Um, how could he not break the law? So the response to that, early on at Tutwiler, people would say, do you want to know why I'm here? I'm like, no, I do not know why you, want, why you are incarcerated. I assume you're sitting in this space because you want to learn how to write poetry. But what, your conviction, um, I don't need to know that. That's, your, that's yours. Uh, it's not a voyeuristic thing on my end. This woman says, I'm telling you anyway. I'm like, okay. She said, I write bad checks at the grocery store. And I know that I'm writing bad checks at the grocery store. So the judge says that this is premeditated fraud or some kind of different level of fraud with the intent because I knew that I was writing a bad check at the grocery store. So our society's response to this is, let's pull this mother away from her children. Children go into foster care, or maybe if there are other family members who can take them, we're gonna put this woman in prison for seven years. Or here's job training, here's a food bank, here's childcare, here's, here's the human response that says, I see you are in a bind. Please find me a mother in this room who would not do anything for their children. If you had to go steal food at the grocery store so that your child could eat, you would do it. You wouldn't feel good about it, but you would do it because you were desperate. So all of this kind of weaves together a little bit in that if we work, and this is where I see the, the powerful role of institutions of education as we work to how do we help our communities and not just the communities that are on our campus, right? How do we help other communities move away from places of desperateness? That where you feel like you do not have any other decision than to sell drugs because there are no jobs in your community. And people are like, well, just move to Birmingham. And I'm like, do you have a clue about how all this works? With what? Where are you gonna stay, right? Um, so, I don't like the term transformational. I don't like to say that our work is transformational. If somebody in our program who has gone through it says our work is, that's fine. Education creates opportunities. Art creates opportunities. We make spaces inside of prisons, and it's a highly academic term here, you guys, to flip on your nerd switch. And you think about this, right? When you deeply fall in love with learning and creating, your life path changes. And you are in charge of that, right? Because you are getting to move into the thing that speaks to you. So that's our objective, is to make that space. Um, to have programming that welcomes all kinds of people with all kinds of backgrounds, with all kinds of goals. We have every walk of life in our classroom. And as an educator, it is an extraordinary teaching experience. Um, I'm looking at my time. One quick story because I want to leave some time for Q&A. Uh, Elmore Correctional is not too, too far from here. The Alabama Department of Corrections doesn't have meaningful education spaces anywhere, right? So we teach in glorified closets or the dining hall or the chapel or visitation or wherever. Um, so we were teaching at the chapel at Elmore and we were teaching a world literature class. A graduate student from Auburn was teaching um, and they were going to uh, look at the novel. Actually, it was a class on the novel. It wasn't world lit. 
And so the first day of class, we're introducing the program and getting some information from the class participants and just going through all the stuff, right? Like the syllabus. And we're maybe 15 or 20 minutes into this, and this is about the right distance. A man walks in um, at the back of the room, and he's just standing there for a long time. And it is a prison. You are aware, right, of movements of people and all kinds of stuff. You have to be. So this fella just keeps standing there. And finally, I was just like, are you in the class? And, and he didn't really say much. <laughs> I was like, okay, do you want to be in the class? And he said, well, yeah. Um, and he just kept standing there. And I was like, well, come on up. We'll get you cleared, for, you know, get you on the roster. And he just kept standing there. And it was uncomfortable. I was uncomfortable. I didn't know what was the best way for me to handle this. And finally, this fella said, I don't read and write so good. And I was like, eh, some could probably say that about me too. Um, and then he said, I actually can't read and write at all. And this man was probably 60. Um, I just turned and I looked at the instructor and I said, community education is open door. That means any person can walk into our classroom and they are welcome here. I said, this is going to be a ton of work and we'll figure it out. Um, so this gentleman joined the class. Each week, we had nothing to do with this. The other men in the class did this. Each week, a guy in the class read the entire novel out loud to this guy and then wrote his reading response. They organized their community, their action, their engagement. Education is so important inside, you guys, it is mind-boggling. On the last day of class, this gentleman comes in and he hands in his final essay and he wrote the first three sentences there was no punctuation every letter was just compressed together but he wrote it and he said i guess if i can take a class from auburn university i can go to abe abe is adult basic education i'm like yes open door there are systems set up in the Alabama Department of Corrections that say that certain people who are inside cannot access education because of their sentence or the time of their sentence, which is not a smart policy. Let me just put it that way. Um, so we become in many ways the only place that people can come. And that's a problem because there isn't enough of us, right? It's just not. We have some time for question and answers. I know that um, you're going to have them ask anything. I am happy to keep rambling. I will ramble forever. Um, but I also think in, in a setting like this that it's just we're engaging in a conversation to potentially I hope explore opportunities about how can our program on the main campus work with AUM? How can we build more of a partnership? How can we create more opportunities? Um, because they're there. It takes work. It always takes work, um, but it's worth it. <laughs>